I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Gabriel Robbins back. He's going to give you uh, the the part two of our history of computer science. Uh, so let's give him a hand and thank him for returning for us. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me up there? So last time uh, we left off with uh, Countess Ada Lovelace. Uh, history's first programmer. She programmed the uh, analytical engine, the difference engine of uh, Charles Babbage, and um, she gets a lot of credit for writing the very first programs and also understanding that computers are very, very general, that they can do many other things besides just add numbers together, which at the time people thought that's what computing machines are good for, adding, subtracting, multiplying, but she realized very quickly this is quoting her from the 1820s, 1830s, that, for example, computers might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity. She said that, and she said computers could be very general and, 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 and help sci lots of other sciences to do their work. Uh, and she was absolutely right. Uh, very, very insightful. Uh, John Venn uh, pioneered set theory back in the mid-1800s. Um, and set theory is uh, very, very ubiquitous, very fundamental to every other field that there is, including computer science theory, as you well know from the theory class that many of you are taking. And uh, he also pioneered combinatorics and uh, logic. He came up with this famous Venn diagram type of way of pictorially or geometrically uh, depicting graphs. Uh, so for example, the Chomsky hierarchy is a Venn diagram. You know, so is this kind of generalized number um, uh, depiction of uh, different classes of numbers and their subset relationships. You can also have Venn diagram humor. Uh, you know, your miles may vary, but they're all offline. You can look at the slides. Nathan will give you a pointer to the slides, but there's uh, different kinds of being funny using uh, Venn diagrams. Uh, Slate magazine, during the Bush administration, uh, resorted to using a Venn diagram to describe all the different constitutional crises of the Bush administration and who's responsible for what. Uh, of course, uh, Dick Cheney was uh, in the intersection of many of these subsets, as you can see here. Uh, and in, during that day, it was very scandalous. Of course, now we have constitutional crisis on a weekly basis, uh, so you know, the Venn diagram gets a lot more complicated than that, but I digress. Uh, j so John Venn gets a lot of credit for doing all this um, uh, kind of uh, early set theory, classical set theory, and of course, his work was built upon by Lewis Carroll, by, uh, excuse me, uh, York Cantor, and we'll talk about him in a second. But meanwhile, uh, Charles Dodgson, also known as Lewis Carroll, um, was a serious mathematician in his own right, but is most famous uh, for his children's books, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. And uh, the uh, Queen of England was uh, so enamored with Alice in Wonderland that she asked uh, Lewis Carroll to dedicate his very next book to her which, of course, he obliged. Uh, of course, his very next book was a treatise on uh, matrices and determinants. Uh, he, si he sent a signed copy to the Queen. Uh, I'm not sure if she appreciated that as much as uh, she did Lewis Carroll's uh, Alice in Wonderland, but still, uh, he had a good sense of humor, and that's very obvious in his works. He invented the, the game Scrabble, actually. Um, how many played Scrabble? So, you know, he, uh, he did that. Uh, and many other things, but uh, mostly his influence uh, his influence is credited for turning a lot of kids towards mathematics and logic and science. So thousands, probably tens of thousands of children over the, over the years, he's probably in the millions by now, uh, based on his work, were really curious about the intricacies of the logic and the math problems are, and the chess problems that are embedded into his storylines and uh, got to intellectually ponder these things and later in life uh, start studying science and mathematics more seriously. So he has a lot of influence. Here are just some of the movies based on his two novels, uh, Alice in Wonderland Through the Looking Glass. And this is just 15 of them. There's many more. Some of them are black and white, you know, dating back to the early 1900s. Uh, and of course, more recently, Alice in Wonderland has been remade yet again with Johnny Depp starring as the Mad Hatter. Uh, and now there's even a sequel uh, a few years after that, uh, Tim Burton directed. So uh, it's kind of perennial. Uh, this, this kind of uh, stories uh, still having uh, influence a century and a half later. 
Uh, this is a small excerpt from one of his uh, books uh, where Alice has a conversation with a white knight, and it's really a master class in semantics. Uh, it refers to a song and also to the name of the song and what the name is really called and what the song really is, and these are all different objects. And you have to almost draw a logic diagram here about what the song is, what it's called, what the name of the song is, and what the name is called, and these are four different things. Of course, when you start splitting hairs like that, uh, you're being much more precise about the use of words, and it gets into this whole field of semantics. Uh, and in programming languages, it's very, very important, because these are, the thing about these is pointers, and pointers to pointers. And all this is embedded in just one page or one conversation of Alice with the White Knight, and the whole book is like that. So uh, very, very insightful uh, stuff. And um, in programming language, of course, semantics is very important. Uh, the denotational semantics of program tell you exactly what the programs do, what the side effects are, and gives you an analytical handle, a formal method kind of handle of, of predicting what uh, programs and pieces of code do and don't do. And, uh, they also help you detect bugs and uh, mismatches between the code and the specification, all very important stuff, especially when lives depend on what the code does or doesn't do, like when it flies a plane or runs a nuclear power plant and so on. So anyway, among many other things, he kind of made that popular. This entire society is dedicated to his work, even to this day. Um, the Alice uh, uh, programming um, system by Randy Pausch of last lecture fame at CMU is named after uh, Lewis Carroll and his works, and this system also, uh, much like the work of Lewis Carroll, drove children into programming at an early age. You can have six and seven and eight-year-old program using this system after just a few hours of dabbling with it. How many heard of this system, the Alice system? It's been downloaded millions of times, and that's a great thing when you can get seven-year-olds to program, especially seven-year-old girls, you know, and, and uh, who often get overlooked historically in terms of doing serious science and mathematics, sadly. Uh, that's, that's a really wonderful contribution to get kids into science, programming, mathematics, and just the scientific thinking in general. They grow up to be more insightful adults. Uh, so back to your Cantor, uh, who took the work of John Venn on finite sets and generalized them to infinite sets. And before your Cantor came around, people thought, you know, it's, it's almost sacrilegious or you know, heresy to, to analyze infinity. Infinity was associated with the divine. And anybody who asked too many questions about that was looked upon with suspicion, and certainly he was. He had trouble publishing his work. Uh, only decades after he died did his work was recognized to be the, the genius masterpiece of uh, rational thinking that it was. And uh, he shows that not only, not, only inf not only all infinities are not created equal, there are bigger ones and smaller ones. In theory, of course, we already talked about that. Uh, but he showed there's an infinity of infinities. And uh, there's this very interesting and subtle structure there. And he uh, formulated the so-called continuum hypothesis, which was open for more than a century. Uh, many theorems are named after him, and it's hard to overstate the contributions that he made to computer science, in particular to the theoretical foundation of computer science, because all of Turing's work uh, is based on his stuff, like Turing's, in, Turing's uh, undecidability stuff, and even Gödel's incompleteness theorem it relates to Cantor's work, and they all credit him for laying down the foundation uh, of their work through methods such as dovetailing, diagonalization, and one-to-one -one correspondences, and cardinalities, and infinities, and so on. So, um, you know, so an infinite hotel example, you know, if you have infinite hotel, infinite number of rooms that are occupied, how do you get one more guest into the hotel? And the simple answer is shift everybody one down by a room, and then the first room gets emptied. The first guy in the lobby gets into the first room, the new guy that wants a room, and everybody is then happy again. You can't do this with finite hotels. And this extension um, can be accommodated even in uh, infinite number of new guests coming in, basically move everybody to twice the room number, that frees up all the odd rooms, the new guests then go into the odd rooms. And again, this is directly from Cantor's work, and in the theory course we kind of went more, more detail about it. You can even accommodate an infinity of infinities by dovetailing uh, through all the infinite number of rows, inf each one containing infinite number of guests and you can still accommodate them into this hotel, which is already full. And at the time, no, it didn't occur to anybody that this was even possible. Uh, nobody even thought to contemplate such things. That's how visionary it was. You know, nowadays, you know, it looks kind of more obvious, but these are, remember, very simple examples. They can get very esoteric and gets into axiom of choice kind of subtleties, and we, I urge you to read the book uh, Infinity and the Mind, which I had on a previous slide, to, to, to learn more about that. So. He basically welcomed us to you know, the, the, the world of infinity, and it's hard to overstate that 
that contribution, many other works use that as a starting point, including Turing, Gödel, and Church. So Bernard Russell, turn of the century, uh, wrote a treatise called Principia Mathematica, and that basically reduced all of mathematics to set theory. Uh, we didn't even know such a thing was possible. So he basically said that set theory is sort of the machine language of mathematics. Everything can be reduced to that in a kind of primitive brute force kind of way, but still, it's amazing that you could do geometry and calculus using only sets and set theory and it's, uh, you know, operators such as intersection and union and complementation and so on. Uh, it took hundreds of pages to prove all that, but uh, he basically axiomatized all the mathematics on the back of set theory, uh, which was kind of you know, one of the early reductions, you know, if you will. We'll talk about reductions in the theory course, we'll talk about anti-completeness and other reductions, but he basically reduced all of mathematics to set theory. Uh, nobody imagined that. Uh, so in some sense, this elevated the, the work of John Venn even to a higher status, and the work of Joel Cantor, because he showed that not only their work is useful, it could subsume all the other works in mathematics and therefore in, in science and engineering that sits on the back of mathematics. And he famously came up with so-called Russell's paradox, uh, uh, you know, the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. That's kind of an inconsistent description. Or a barber that shaves only those in his village that do not shave themselves. Again, you can come up with very quick uh, contradictions when you start thinking about certain types of sets that may not even be valid sets, but they sound like they do. And he was an early proponent of gay rights and racial equality. Remember, this is 1900. This is not, not even the 60s when the, um, uh, these movements took more popular turns, but uh, at the time he was uh, a humanitarianism uh, activist before people even knew what that term means. Uh, so that's uh, pretty good. He also won a Nobel Prize uh, later on. And uh, so he profoundly influenced all of math and philosophy and everything else. Uh, one of the people he mentored was uh, Wittgenstein uh, and certainly influenced Gödel and uh, Church and Turing and uh, many other thinkers that came after him. So he laid the foundation along with others to, to all of computer science. Um, and these are some of the books um, written by Russell. You know, he doubled in every field that there was. He talked about logic and education and politics and philosophy and morals and ethics and uh, geometry, of course, and uh, individualism. And you know, here are some more books by Russell. These are not books about Russell. These are books authored by Russell. And I'm just showing you a few. And that's how prolific he was. You know, he talked about uh, fiction and religion and uh, ideals and morals and certain countries and political uh, thought, and uh, pretty amazing uh, for somebody to be so prolific. Uh, uh, and uh, so he gets a lot of credit. Uh, once he famously said, most people would sooner die than think, uh, in fact, they do so. Uh, that was one of his witticisms. And uh, here's a little bit of Principia Mathematica on a t-shirt. Uh, Russell's paradox, right before Principia Mathematica went to print, as it was being prepared to, to be printed, uh, somebody asked him, what about the set of all sets that do not contain themselves? And it's hard to reconcile that. You know, this is kind of a naive set theory kind of approach to defining a set, because it leaves you with an immediate contradiction, right? And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of an endemic built-in problem into axiomatic theories. And Gödel kind of leveraged on that and generalized and showed that this is a problem in every formal axiomatic system as, uh, you know, it, can, it cannot be uh, consistent and complete at the same time, meaning that there are uh, statements that are true but not provable in the system. And that's just not a problem with set theory, it's a problem with every system that uses axiom to reason with, and that includes every system that we ever, that we ever come up with. Uh, all the systems that we use today, certainly. All of our math and science and engineering are of that nature. They're, they're axiomatic in some sense. Um, so uh, that, that was an, an amazing kind of negative result uh, that showed kind of the limits of axiomatic thinking. Of course, that's the best we got right now. We don't know how to do better than that yet. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that kind of ushered in certain uh, uh, insights about the way we do math and the way we do science and the limits thereof, you know, at least in theory. Okay. So here it is depicted nicely in a cartoon about, you know, Pinocchio. He says, my nose will now grow. Of course, Pinocchio, as you know, the, the, his nose grows if and only if he's lying. So if he's lying, his nose will not grow. 
but if he's lying, his nose should grow. And that's a contradiction. Conversely, if he's telling the truth, then his nose will grow, but if his nose grows, he's lying, so he's not telling the truth. So this is kind of my favorite you know, single cartoon image depiction of Russell's paradox. Uh, for the Trekkies in the crowd, you know, that's how Captain Kirk once uh, defeated an evil android by you know, giving him Russell's paradox, saying, I am lying. And then uh, smoke started coming out of his head. How many even know what I'm talking about, by the way? Star Trek? Okay, anyway, your mileage may vary, but um, I think that was, that was cute. So uh, that, that, that kind of capitalizes on Cantor's uh, principle of diagonalization, in which we'll talk about in the theory course quite a bit. We already have quite a bit. And uh, again, very insightful, fundamental observations about the limits of axiomatic reasoning and the very limits of mathematics and uh, scientific uh, thought and uh, very beautiful, unexpected, and actually su somewhat surprising and, and almost disturbing, really disturbing results. Uh, so David Hilbert uh, actually has popularized Cantor's work after Cantor's death, actually, and uh, he's one of the reasons that Cantor got so much credit even sooner than he would have otherwise. Uh, still, it took a good number of decades for people to, for mathematicians to appreciate the, the full impact, beauty, and gener generalizability of, of Cantor's work. And Hilbert's uh, uh, contributions are too numerous to list, but famously he came up with his list of 23 open problems. Uh, he also contributed to Einstein's theory of relativity. He actually beat Einstein uh, to some of the relativity, general relativity field equations that Einstein published in, in, in 1915. 1905 was his specific um, special relativity, but of course uh, Hilbert was graceful enough to kind of step back and let Einstein publish the full theory because he came up with it and he was on his way to discovering the, the full generality anyway and Hilbert knew that. Uh, so that's pretty good. He scooped Einstein actually on, on certain things mathematically. Uh, and then he was humble enough to, to not insist on, on, on credit for that. Uh, so uh, he influenced also, as I said, Gödel, Church, Turing, von Neumann, and Many others. In fact, my Neumann was was Hilbert's PA. Uh, he was, uh, you know, Hilbert's uh, RA for you know in his lab. He was uh, Hilbert's uh, research assistant, which is pretty cool for for both of them actually. I mean, it's cool for for uh, uh, for Hilbert to have my Neumann as his lab assistant, and it's also cool for my Neumann to be Hilbert's assistant. Uh, they're both uh, amazing thinkers and contributors to science and computer science theory in science in general. So here are some of the books describing uh, Hilbert's work. Um, and of course, Moon Crater, named after him. That's pretty sizable. Uh, and you can see his impact simply from the things that are named after him. There's Hilbert's axioms, Hilbert's inequalities, Hilbert matrices. There's Hilbert uh, spaces, right, of infinite dimensions. You know, if you can wrap your mind around what, what does it mean to have an infinite number of dimensions, not just seven. You know, four dimensions is hard enough to visualize. Imagine having an infinite number of dimensions. Uh, space filling curves and uh, um, the hotel paradox that he popularized and so on. So uh, it's, it's really quite amazing. But in the International Congress of Mathematics in the year 1900, he got up and in his keynote address, he gave a speech where he listed uh, 23 problems that he said that all of mathematics, in fact, all of humanity, you know, the sciences too, should should work on in the 20th century, and it was probably the most influential, influential list of open problems ever written down. Uh, in fact, some of them are still open to this day, and each and every one of those problems in attempts to solve them um, gave rise to entire new mathematical fields, not, never mind just mathematical results. Um, and hundreds of famous mathematicians, probably thousands of famous mathematicians, built their careers on trying to solve one or more of these problems. Um, so that was uh, quite amazing. Uh, DARPA came up with their own list of problems a few years back, kind of mimicking his, and they have, sure enough, have 23 on their list, not, not coincidentally, because they're trying to sort of do on the military research side what, what he did on uh, the mathematical side. But, you know, good luck to them with that. But still, you know, they, they pay homage to, um, to his contributions by even making up such a list. So specifically, problem number 10 has to find an algorithm that Given a Diophantine equation, that's just a polynomial uh, over integers, you know, an arbitrary polynomial with n variables over, over integers, has solutions in integers. And one of them is the Pythagorean theorem. That's a simple case. Obviously, there's many solutions, like 3, 4, and 5. But from Maslow's theorem, it says that if the degree is bigger than 2, 
uh, you know, the generalization of uh, Pythagorean theorem to higher degrees is, is not solvable in integers. That's another special case example. But in general, that problem is very, very uh, ubiquitous and general and hard to solve. And uh, finally, that problem was solved 1970, 70 years after um, Hilbert laid it down and named it. Uh, and the solution was, was quite surprising in its own right. Basically, Matyashevitz in 19... Uh, 70 showed that uh, every Turing recognizable set of numbers coincides exactly with the positive solutions or the positive values of some polynomial, given enough variables and given enough high degree and so on. So for example, the set of prime numbers is exactly the positive values of this expression. You plug in random numbers for this 26 variable polynomial, if the answer is positive, it is prime. And it's an if and only if. If the, if the answer is negative, it's not prime, obviously. But it's not an approximation for the primes. Uh, it's exactly the prime numbers, the positive values of this point. And it seems unbelievable. Of course, this is not derived in isolation by accident. He gave a systematic method to arriving at arbitrary polynomials for arbitrary Turing computable sets. So in some sense, what, what he said with this result is that using polynomials, you can do arbitrary computation. You can have a polynomial that can mimic the work of any computer program whatsoever. So in some sense, you can have a polynomial that plays Sudoku with you, or a polynomial that runs Unix operating system. I'm not saying it'll be a short polynomial or, or a simple polynomial, but the point is that polynomial exists. So polynomials are yet another way to do universal computation. We had no idea that this, this, could, be, this could be true, much less that it was true. Um, we don't think it's polynomial as arbitrary or general kind of object. We think of very specific equations, especially over integers only. Uh, so that was an amazing result. Uh, again, this is I'm giving you one example of uh, the impact of Hilbert's list of 23 problems, never mind everything else that he did um, and how long-lasting it is. So um, there's even a universal polynomial because you know, one piece of code can do the work of many other pieces of code, like a compiler. Once you give it the right input, it can do arbitrarily <laughs> complex other computations based on what the input looks like when interpreted as an arbitrary program. So one of these polynomials is actually like a compiler polynomial or universal polynomial that based on the first parameter, and the second parameter is the input, will compute an arbitrary Turing machine corresponding to this number in some sort of a girdle numbering or dovetailing kind of a numbering with that being the input, and um, you can have a universal polynomial, just like you can have a universal Turing machine or a universal program, for example, a compiler. So that's another, just one corollary of this piece of work that you know, was instigated by, by Hilbert. And, and his entire conference is on it to this day. Here's a conference from just 10 years ago, and I'm sure there's been others since, where Matthias Shevitz himself was a keynote speaker, and um, uh, one of the contributors to, to this work was uh, Julia Robinson, which in the 40s and 50s and 60s, did a lot of work that led up to this result. Uh, so she gets a lot of credit too, and she was one of the early female mathematicians, really very, very serious mathematician that, uh, and she paved the way for other, other women to walk in their footsteps and, and do serious science and math, and uh, so she gets a lot of credit for that too. Uh, Hilbert's problem number 18 was about tilings, and tilings is a very deep and, uh, uh, non-obvious and subtle uh, field. There's something called the kissing number of spheres. How many spheres can touch another sphere in different dimensions? In the plane, in two dimensions, you can have, say, six nickels around one nickel, all touching the center nickel. How many can kind of visualize six nickels around one nickel, all touching the center? Okay. In 3D, you can have um, 12 oranges all touching the central orange, but not more than 12, because there's not enough room to squeeze one more in that the, all of them still touch the the central orange. Well, it seems obvious in 2D and 3D, although the 3D version took decades and decades to prove, probably over a century. It's called, it was called Kepler's problem. Uh, it turns out that to this day, we don't know of any other kissing numbers, so-called numbers of how many spheres can touch an identical sphere in an arbitrary dimension in, from four on up. We don't know the number for four, five, six, except we happen to know the number for dimension 24, and number for that is 196,560 spheres, hyperspheres, all touching the central sphere. Oh, 8 and 16, okay. 
so I should update these slides. Uh, but if it happened only last year, uh, again, this illustrates how hard this problem is because Kepler asked that problem in 1611, you know, four centuries plus ago. And, uh, and the reason we even know that the kissing number in 24 dimensions, that's kind of an oddball dimension. Why? This is the exact number, by the way. It's not approximation. It's not upper or lower bound. That's the number. There's something called a leech matrix that has a very special st structure that in 24 dimensions gives you this answer right out of the structure of this group you know, uh, I induced by the leech, um, um, the leech group uh, of, of symmetries. Anyway, so uh, all, the, all that, again, is instigated by by Hilbert, and of course, when, when the spheres are different sizes, that's even much, much harder, or they have different shapes than spheres, like you know, how many M&Ms could be squeezed into a particular volume. That, that's much, much harder. Uh, and space-filling curves and uh, space-filling tilings, so packing and tiling problems, they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, again, a very, very uh, prolific field. Uh, we were wondering uh, for many, for probably a decade, uh, actually many decades, whether there could be a set of tiles that aperiodically uh, tiled the plane. In fact, up, up until the, the 70s, it wasn't even known that that's possible in 2D, to tile the plane aperiodically. So the tiling, you know, if you look at the wall, there's these squares that appear at regular intervals, but that's a very periodic, kind of boring kind of a tiling, squares side by side. You know, you could do more interesting tiling, say, with hexagons or triangles, but to have an aperiodic tiling that, say, looks like this, with odd-shaped uh, pieces that tile the plane aperiodically. So no, no, aperiodically means this. If you take this in the plane and you shift it any amount you want, it'll never coincide with itself again. Of course, a boring tiling like squares, if you shift it just one square over or one square up or seven squared over and five squares up, it'll coincide with itself. It's indistinguishable from its original configuration, assuming an infinite plane. Here, can't do that. Uh, and it turns out that after Penrose came up with this in the 70s, um, we thought it was still an intellectual kind of curiosity, mathematical, you know, cool trick. Uh, but it turns out that nature uh, gives rise to structures like that, too, in the form of quasi-crystals. How many realize quasi-crystals are aperiodic? How, how many heard of quasi-crystals? Okay. Um, so there's crystalline structures that arise in natural settings, right, in the ground and in caves and so on, that, that give rise to aperiodic space-filling three-dimensional kind of tilings, and we didn't know that uh, until we finally discovered it years after he said that it's possible in theory. Uh, before he said that, we wouldn't even realize what we're looking at when we saw these crystals, because they're aperiodic. And in, now they're used quite a bit in architecture. Uh, again, all this is from Hilbert's problem, you know, number 18, um, and many other things came from it, too. You can show it's undecidable uh, to determine whether a given set of tiles tiles the plane aperiodically, or even tiles the plane at all, even periodically. Uh, impossible to, um, to say in general. It's undecidable for arbitrary sets of tiles. And now, of course, these tilings appear on the facade of buildings. Here's a building with aperiodic tiling in Melbourne, Australia. And here's a few other aperiodic tilings, just so you can see uh, the variety and diversity of them. So this is Pentagon boat and star shaped, named correspondingly after these uh, three shapes. And they, you know, if you look at it, no area kind of repeats another area, not in a global sense. Uh, so it's kind of very interesting to look at because your eyes keep looking for patterns which aren't there, of course. And here are some more aperiodic tilings. So this is a rectilinear one. This one is made of rhombuses or parallelograms, if you will. This one made of uh, triangles. And by the way, on the left, there's the uh, generation rules for uh, these um, tilings. Just showing you a few more for you know diversity and there's thousands known by now. Some of them are not even rectilinear. They're not even uh, have straight lines. They're more kind of odd-shaped um, uh, kind of uh, figures or tiles. Right. Again, I'm just showing you a few more for diversity here. Very fascinating field. And it has lots of practical applications. For example, if you have a material made of an aperiodic kind of crystalline structure, it will not shatter like glass very easily because glass shatters because the, the crystal is kind of... Uh, uh, pe periodic and, and, a, and a fault line kind of propagates arbitrarily far and quickly through the material, causing failure or shattering uh, or breaks. But uh, if it's aperiodic, uh, it doesn't repeat. So any kind of regular structure eventually ends very quickly in the atomic structure, and the material can, can quickly become very, very strong this way, maybe even bulletproof, uh, shatterproof. So there's all sorts of industrial applications for this, and 
It's a very robust field. Again, all coming up of just one, uh, one portion of Hilbert's 18th problem of the list of 23, aside from everything else. I'm just showing you a glimpse of the impact that he had and still has on our, our world today. Kurt Gödel, uh, it's hard to overstate uh, the importance of his work. So he's the first person that showed that something is off kilter with axiomatic reasoning. And we had no idea. We've been doing that for you know, over 2,000 years since Euclid's time. Uh, but he showed that every formal axiomatic system is uh, incomplete. There are statements in there which are true but not provable necessarily. And not just about our math system, but anybody. So if you have some alien ancient race that you know, has you know, done all sorts of amazing spacefaring kind of achievements and terraforming planetary kind of achievements and has been around for a billion years. And, but if they use axioms to do their reasoning, their systems are incomplete too, necessarily. And we, and we know that because of his result. Um, so it's not just a problem of our math. Uh, so it really put uh, you know, scientific and mathematical reasoning into this interesting perspective uh, that there are some limits to what we can know and not know. And uh, there's all sorts of interesting implications of that. And uh, he was very good friends with Albert Einstein. So when asked once, Einstein both lived in the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, New Jersey, they asked Einstein, what's your favorite thing about being at the Institute for Advanced Study? And he said, it's my morning walks to the office with my buddy Gödel. Uh, and the two of them spent a lot of time thinking and contemplating and sharing ideas. Uh, all these people influenced each other. Why Neumann was there, at, you know, of course Alonzo Church was there, Turing was there at Princeton and the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, if you want to read one good book about uh, Gödel and his achievements, read this one, Gödel Escher Bach, and for the, for the history uh, you know, part, and not just for history, but for the actual ideas. They, this book goes through and tells you about uh, the significance and tenets and ideas of his work and ties it together with the art of uh, Maurice Escher and, of course, the musical uh, compositions of Johann Sebastian Bach, and uh, it makes very interesting connections between these, uh, these things. Uh, so again, very uh, impactful work. Uh, he basically founded um, modern logic, which was a branch of philosophy, and kind of revolutionized it. Uh, so uh, a little bit more about his incompleteness theorem. A system is sound if the only true statement can be proven, and complete if any statement or its negation can be proven. And of course, it's consistent if no statement and its negation can be proven. So ideally, you want a system that's sound, complete, and consistent. Right? And Hilbert's, one of his problems said, um, you know, find a set of axioms that is both consistent and complete. In other words, everything that's true could be proven in this system of uh, axioms. And he didn't, he didn't ask whether there is such a thing. He asked to give such a thing. He assumed implicitly that such a thing exists. Girl showed it can't. Uh, so this is a case where one of Hilbert's problems was solved in a very surprising, unexpected way. Hilbert says, find me something, and uh, assuming that it can be found, and here comes young Kurt Gödel that showed, uh, no, you can't even ask that, because uh, that's just the thing doesn't exist, much less can be found. So he basically showed that pr truth and provability are two separate issues. They're two separate matters. We used to think that they're one and the same. Whatever is true in mathematics can be proved, and whatever is false can be disproved. We thought that these two concepts coincide. He said, no, they, they don't coincide. And that was a surprise to the human species. We had no idea that, that that's even possible. You know, so, so some axiomatic systems are, are trivial enough that they are complete, but that's not surprising. They can't even do addition. Like proposition logic you know, is complete and consistent and then, you know, with truth tables and so on. Uh, but that's not enough to do all of math. You can't even do multiplication inside uh, propositional logic. But to show that... Uh, you know, all of our math cannot be both consistent and complete, that was kind of shocking. So he basically showed for the first time that they're not the same concept. Uh, just like when you grow up, you think that everything is legal is just, and everything that's just is legal. Uh, as you grow older, you realize not so much, you know, and, and you kind of lose that, that innocence. So this is where kind of mathematics lost a bit of its innocence, um, thanks to Gödel. And it's a good thing because, you know, he was right. So it's, it's good to know that, right? Now, why is consistency so important? You know, he, so he, sh he showed us you can't have both, consistency and completeness. Which do you think is more important, for a mathematical system to be consistent or for it to be complete? Complete being every true thing can be proven. What do you say? I'm going to say 
completeness is more important than consistency. You shouldn't be able to prove false things, but if you can't prove everything, it's still okay. How many say con you know, that, that consistency is, you must have consistency. You know, if it, good. Consistency is very important. Because if, if you can start proving false things, the system very quickly implodes on itself and everything becomes true and you can't distinguish truth from falsehood. It becomes useless. Um, and uh, just to, to drive home the point, let me give you an example, a dramatic example of that. So consider the set, I'm going to prove that Trump is, is the Pope. Uh, which, you know, under today's political climate, uh, you know, may not surprise you. Uh, but here's how you prove that Trump was the Pope, assuming that one is equal to two. I'm going to show you how from one inconsistent false statement you can prove arbitrarily weird things. So assume that one is equal to two, and consider the set Trump and the Pope, right? And take the cardinality of that set, which is, of course, two, but two is equal to one, as we assumed, you know, erroneously up here, so the cardinality of this set is also one, which means the two elements coincide, because the set is now one cardinality, and therefore Trump is the Pope, and that's uh, the end of that proof. So, and of course, you can prove that any two things are equal, which means the system is completely useless to discern truth from falsehood or establish any interesting results. You can't even count in this system, because all numbers are equal. So no number has a successor that's different than itself, and so on, so you can't even do addition, never mind any higher math, and yeah. So, you know, when your friends ask you what you did in class today, just Tell them, you know, we, we prove that Trump is the Pope. And they'll say, oh, okay. Um, so uh, it's hard to overestimate the uh, uh, impact and uh, consequences of his work. It's just amazing. Uh, Alonzo Church uh, invented lambda calculus and gave you know, footing to the work of many others, including his student Turing. And uh, Turing, um, it's hard to overestimate what he's done. He's the first guy to first define what it means to compute. Before that, we thought we knew, but we really didn't, because nobody ever came up with a formal definition of computation, right? He proved the undecidability of the halting problem in a theory course, we'll actually prove that. And he talked about hypercomputations and oracles. He invented AI, basically, uh, with his famous paper that, that also listed the Turing test as one of the ways to the identify intelligence, a very operational, pragmatic test for identifying intelligence. And there's, there's many practical applications of that, uh, including the reverse Turing test, which is CAPTCHAs, where a computer tries to verify that you're human by having to solve a little problem involving you know, recognizing certain optical characters. Um, and he anticipated neural networks. He invented neural networks. How many knew that? Neural nets are his, his thing also. Today, it's called machine learning. Um, so he's the founder of all of machine learning in, in this sense. And he built the uh, Manchester Mark I computer back in the late 40s. And of course, famously, he helped decipher the German Enigma code, which helped World War II to end sooner than it would have otherwise, and thereby you probably saved billions of, of lives for doing that. Uh, and of course, the Turing Award is named after him. So he gets a lot of uh, credit for a great many things. Here's his um, famous bomb computer that uh, you saw in the movie uh, Imitation Game. Right? There's many other movies about him and books. Here are just a few stage plays. And uh, how many have seen the imitation game, right? So that kind of depicts at least some of his work, the work pertaining to World War II. But it, it omits dozens of other contributions that are probably even more significant and more impactful. Um, so he gets a lot of, a lot of credit uh, for, for these things. He's uh, you know, one of the true pillars of all of computer science and all of technology today. Uh, here's one of the earliest programs by his own hand written for the ACE computer, which he also designed. Uh, back in the 40s, late 40s. And here are some of the books written about his work, in case you want to dive deeper into his contributions and uh, all the things that he did, um, going sort of beyond the movie and the, uh, uh, sometimes he's referred to the, not just the ghost in the machine, but the ghost in every machine, because uh, he's, he's there very dramatically. Um, so uh, he was running around Princeton back in the 30s, when he was a graduate student. And uh, of course, you know, uh, how did we thank him uh, for all these contributions. Basically, we killed him off for being gay. Uh, back in the 50s, it was illegal to be gay in uh, Britain. And uh, interestingly, not until many, many years later, 2009, did the British government finally said they're sorry for, for what they did to him. Uh, and that took uh, you know, a good 60 years for that apology. Uh, long in coming. Uh, but uh, some apologies took even worse, uh, longer time. So the apology to Galileo by the Catholic Church took 350 years for them to finally say, okay, we, we were kind of off kilter for how we treated Galileo, putting him under house arrest for saying the Earth is not the center of the universe. 
So, you know, the meta theorem there is that <coughs> a late apology is better than no apology, but the corollary is that, you know, sooner is better. If you've done something wrong, you know, it's good to apologize. Uh, but try to do it sooner rather than later. Some politicians can take a lesson from that uh, you know, wisdom here. But anyway, uh, this entire conference is on his work every year to this day. Uh, it's hard to overestimate the significance uh, of his work. A lot of it came from 1937 paper by him, single author, only 35 pages, but where it's the most influential paper ever written, probably other I mean, it's certainly in the top five, let's put it that way. Uh, right up there with Einstein's theory of relativity in 1905 and, say, um, uh, Shannon's famous paper that founded all of information theory back in 1948, 49, uh, upon which everything we do to communicate today is based on, on that Shannon paper, including cell phones and tweets and, and the web and everything else. So it's the first paper that gave the formal definition of computation, defined what an algorithm is, defined Turing machines, the notion of universal computation, that one algorithm can do the work of any other algorithm. One Turing machine can do the work of any other Turing machine. Or one program, such as a compiler, can behave like any other program based on what you give it as input. One string that's interpreted as code can make the compiler behave in arbitrary ways. That was news to humanity. We thought you need different computers for different things, different machines at least for different things. You know, we thought if you need to watch a videotape, you know, even, so, uh, even until years ago, if you want to watch a videotape or, or a movie, you'd use a VCR or television to watch movies. You'd use a phone to communicate. You'd use an answering machine to answer calls. You need a phone to make calls. If you want to go shopping, you'd have to get into your car to, 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 to do the shopping. If you, uh, you know, wanted to uh, you know, uh, do different things, you needed different devices. Now it's all converged to a single device, and it's as small as a little box, and it sits in your pocket as a smartphone. And this kind of convergence of technology, the ubiquity of um, you know, technology converging into single, small set of machines, maybe even one machine that can do all these things is due to him. He, he anticipated that in that very paper. So he gets a lot of credit for all that. And uh, here's his actual proof that the halting problem is undecidable. We will not go into the details here, but in the theory course we will uh, analyze this proof and its implications, right? And uh, computational universality is, is something also pioneered by him. He showed that other systems can compute like lambda calculus by church, and of course Boolean circuits, and the Conway's game of life is computationally universal, and so is DNA computing. Um, we are DNA computers, so that we are living proofs that DNA, that, that chemistry can compute. You don't need transistors and uh, electricity and wires and uh, silicon to compute. You can do it using molecules and proteins and goo. You know, which is what we are, right? I'm not saying it in a, in a derogatory way. Uh, I'm saying it in a complementary way, if anything. In fact, uh, we're such sophisticated computers that all the other computers are output of us, not the other way around. Turns out you can also compute with gravitational systems and billiards and many other, many other things. You can show, Richard, Richard Feynman famously showed that you can have billiard-based billiard computers. You know, we can have and and or, in that case, using billiard balls, and the collisions between them will basically simulate arbitrarily complex computations. You know, again, that's not that surprising given Turing's work. Um, and you can even implement computers using Tinker Toys or Lego or Meccano uh, or even uh, nuts and bolts, right? Uh, in the theory of the course, we'll get more into these kind of details. You can easily implement computers, arbitrary computations using uh, water pipes, right? A constrictor, constriction in the wires like a resistance, transistors like a faucet. Right, a diode is like a one-way valve. Capacitor is like a diaphragm across a, a water pipe. So with these components, you can have entire computers made of nothing but water pipes. Right, um, and again, that's that's based on Turing's work, and it shows that computation and computational universality is everywhere. Compu the universe around us computes in in so many ways that we didn't notice, and that's what makes certain things difficult. And there was a debate: what's the what's the smallest Turing machine that's universal? whether there's one existing that has only uh, two states and three symbols, and that was open for ever since Turing, and uh, Stephen Wolfram put a $25,000 bounty on this problem, and within months, a undergraduate solved it, which is interesting. So he found the smallest universal Turing machine that does arbitrary computations based on what you give it as input. Turns out it's this one, two states, three symbols. And you can also prove that that's the smallest one possible, by the way, so this is exactly where universality explodes from a very, very small, tiny little simple device or, or computer made of two states. And of course, the Turing test, you know, the, the Turing church thesis, what does it mean for something to be computable? And uh, uh, intuitively, 
to this day, we believe that computation is whatever a Turing machine can do, and it's equivalent to what humans can do intuitively when we say think or compute or figure or um, calculate or whatever it is, however it is you want to refer to what our brains do. And there's a lot of evidence that that's the case. And with smarter and smarter programs, it, you could, you know, the, the evidence keeps piling up that eventually machines will be able to do everything that humans do. They already do much of what humans can do, and much faster, by the way, not just a little bit faster, but you know, 10 or 9 or 12 orders of magnitude faster in some cases you know, for certain things. And now comp computers are beginning to drive cars, and uh, you have self-driving cars already on the market. You can buy one. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And again, all that goes back to, to Turing. Uh, and the reason it's called a thesis, not a theorem, is because it's hard to quantify what humans can do exactly. Um, how much time do I have? Is it? Uh, all right. So, so humans, um, and what we do, we sort of think we know what we do when we think and compute and make intelligence, uh, intel intelligent observations. But it's hard to quantify that mathematically. So, um, but uh, but as far as we know, uh, a Turing machine is the most powerful model of computation we have, and it's it's very simple: a bunch of states, a transition function, finite alphabet, and. Uh, and all these systems are equivalent to one another, and that's what the Church Turing thesis says. And again, him, him and his advisor, PhD advisor, uh, Alonzo Church, kind of pioneered that notion together. And uh, certain things we still have trouble with implementing in, 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 in computers or in code, such as humor and aesthetics and notions like justice and um, emotions. Uh, but that's OK. Uh, even humans have a hard time defining what these things mean, much less explaining to an algorithm or coming up with a mechanical uh, system or an algorithm or a piece of software that, that does these things that we can't even define or specify very well. But they're not nothing, right? So computers beat humans in chess even in the mid-90s, 1997. There's a computer beating Gary Kasparov, the world's chess champion, and he doesn't look very happy about that as he lost to IBM's Deep Blue, and very dramatically there were movies made about it called Game Over, and Newsweek said the brain's last stand, uh, you know, because over-dramatizing it. But you know, again, it's just a pretty straightforward algorithm. Less, less, uh, um, more, more sophisticated than chess playing programs, even is the winning of uh, computers against humans in Jeopardy. And there's uh, IBM's Watson beating the world's champions in, uh, in Jeopardy in 2011. And more recently, AlphaGo by Google beat the world's Go champion just a couple of years ago, uh, Lisa Dole. And uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, Turing machines is the iPad, of course. And the, my really favorite Turing machine is the Tesla Model S. Uh, so it's, I call this my Turing machine with an O. And it has a self-driving autopilot. And on top of that, it can go 0 to 60 in 2.3 seconds, which you know, that beats Ferraris and Lamborghinis. So of course, uh, I had to get one. And, uh, <laughs> and in the theory course, um, towards the end of the course, Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, in the theory course, towards the later part of the course, we'll give rides. We'll pick a weekend day, we'll bring out the Tesla, and we can have rides around the block. I, I, get, I get to drive, by the way. You don't, you don't drive. But, but, but you can ride in it and feel the acceleration. It's really cool. So with that, um, let's stop there. and. Uh, We'll put this lecture on the web, and the slides will be on the web. Nathan will give you a pointer to it. And we'll hear more, a lot more about all these things in the theory course that many of you are in. So thank you. I didn't quite get to uh, von Neumann today, but I highly encourage you to, to look up facts about von Neumann on your own time. He's a really fascinating character and did really important things for computer science and many other things. Uh, but for the sake of your worksheet, it's OK if those questions are blank. Um, so I will see you next week. Be sure to drop off your worksheets on your way out. Thank you, and th let's thank Professor Robbins again. <laughs>